I recently attended an event down at the Anglican Church in my town. The Reverend screened a DVD of a 2008 debate between Professors Richard Dawkins and John Lennox on the subject of whether science has buried God. The event was organized to coincide with the Global Atheist Convention in Melbourne, and consisted of the DVD followed by a brief discussion and supper. Dawkins and Lennox discussed numerous topics, such as whether God is petty for concerning himself with sin and caring about one tiny speck of dust in a vast cosmos, if miracles are unscientific, and if religious scientists like Lennox l lose their credibility by believing in them, if Christ really existed, and if God is needed to explain the universe, and if God requires a much more complicated explanation. As an atheist, I was certainly on Dawkins' side, but I think that there were one or two things that he could have argued better. Dawkins asserts that it isn't helpful to postulate a god as the creator of the universe, as the god's existence requires an even more complicated explanation than the universe itself. I'm an atheist, and even I don't think that notion works. Lennox counters this argument by stating that God is an eternal force, or Logos as he described it, that always existed and was necessary for the universe to be. During a recent episode of Q&A, Cardinal Pell, who was also debating against Dawkins, expressed a similar sentiment. I believe that everything in our universe has a rational explanation, but God could very well exist beyond space and time, and therefore beyond rational explanation, and how can I say that he isn't? Notions of the complexity and improbability of God lack weight when you're talking about something that could be beyond and or greater than the universe. What Dawkins should have said to Pell and Lennox is this. Claiming that God is beyond space, time, and natural laws only outlines how God might exist, and says nothing about whether God actually exists. Thus, God requires evidence like anything else. Also, calling God petty felt more like a personal objection to the idea of God than a clear refutation of his existence. This brings me on to why I call myself an atheist. Unlike agnostics, I believe that the existence of God is knowable, and I don't believe in God because I have encountered no evidence for God's existence. Dawkins defended natural selection and the development of life through unguided processes, and rightly stressed that whatever you get out of religion means nothing if it isn't true. But while Dawkins presented many scenarios, evolution, personhood, concepts of morality and meaning, that don't need God, he didn't go into enough detail on why God didn't have a role in them. Dawkins let the absence of evidence for God speak for itself, but this consequently made his arguments less strong. As such, I don't think Dawkins brought his A-game to this debate. I love Richard Dawkins, but I'll be the first to admit that he is rather arrogant. It also seems that Dawkins, with his passion for science, flair with language, and his dignified, commanding delivery, is very good at educating us and arguing against religion on his own, but not so much when debating against others. Otherwise, this evening was a very intellectually stimulating experience, and Professor Lennox, Dawkins' opponent, seems to be a very intelligent and lucid man. I disagreed with most of his points, especially the belief that a complicated system like DNA must have had a designer, but he argued his case effectively. After the screening, we heard some comments from the audience. As you can imagine, I was irritated by the dogmatic, overly righteous statements from some of the audience, but most of the people there were very polite and civil, and during supper, I had a very fun, civil chat with a couple of friendly guys who work at the church. Actually, what they said stuck in my mind the longest after the evening, and this video is partly dedicated to them. These guys claimed that there is no such thing as transitional fossils, as there is no evidence of these organisms evolving into each successive step and finally evolving into modern life forms. I think this argument is completely wrong for multiple reasons, and I just devised an analogy-based counterargument that I'm rather excited about. 
It is true that we haven't observed much macroevolution in the present day, but this is because evolution takes place over long periods of time, usually hundreds of thousands to millions of years, and transitional fossils, along with genetic analysis and embryology, provide persuasive evidence that this macroevolution happened in the past. You can find a good selection of transitional fossils in my top 9 favorite transitional fossils video. We have directly observed microevolution, or change within species, and Darwin demonstrated that these minor adaptations will result in huge changes over long time frames. Microevolution will produce macroevolution in the long term. This explains how, in over 3 billion years of gradual ch adaptive change, the earliest primitive bacteria ultimately resulted in us. We have been able to plot the evolution of nearly every major group of life on the planet through the unearthing of transitional forms in the fossil record. Due to the features they share with both their ancestors and apparent descendants, it is quite clear that these ancient organisms represent steps in development from one kind of life to another, for instance, from reptiles to mammals, dinosaurs to birds, and apes to humans. We have discovered and documented thousands of transitional fossils, but there will always be gaps in the fossil record. Fossilization requires very specific conditions, and the majority of life that ever existed has vanished without a trace. But absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence. Just because we don't have the remains of a hypothetical species between Metazognathus and Tiktaalik, two transitional forms on the road from fishes to amphibians, it still doesn't disprove the very high likelihood that Metazognathus evolved into Tiktaalik and onward into full amphibians. How many steps in the chain do creationists need before they're satisfied that transitional forms really existed? And arguing that we can't be sure that successive transitional forms are related to each other is like saying that you can't be certain that this equation is right just because you didn't see me solve it. When you look at this simple equation, it's obvious that these numbers, when added together, equal 10, even though you didn't see me solve it. You know this because you know addition. Likewise, we know that the many fossils of, say, synapsids, also known as mammal-like reptiles, with their increasingly advanced jaw structure, specialized teeth, and upright stance, clearly represent transitional steps from reptiles to mammals, even though we didn't see these transitional forms evolve into each other. Evolutionary biologists are certain that present-day life forms evolved from past ancestors due to fossil evidence linking them to the past and genetic and embryonic similarities all implying common descent from earlier forms, even though it's impossible to directly observe this evolution without a time machine. Anyway, those are some of my thoughts on the debate that I attended last week. It was a fun event, and I look forward to another one in the future. I'm also interested to read your comments regarding my positions on religion, evolution, God's existence, and so on. Thanks for watching. Cheers.